Okay, so hopefully this is a quick background introduction lecture to White Degrasso C by Jean Rees. So Jean Rees is our author. She was born in 1890 in Roseau, Dominica, which you'll find is Dominica is one of the settings of um, White Degrasso C. She grew up there as a child and then lived as an expatriate later on in 1907 to 1979 in England and Europe. Her father, just not too much you need to know about him, but the fact that he settled in Dominica where he met Jean's mother, Minna Lockhart. Um, and she, her mother, Minna, is a third generation white Creole from Dominica and her whole family was a, had a history as slave owners. Um, this is important to note because this is a really big part of why it's a grass to see. Um, Minna Lockhart was described as cold, disapproving, and distant, and thought to have conformed to the English culture. And essentially, Jane's relationship with her mother replicated one between strangers. Like, it, they just did not have a good relationship. And you can kind of definitely see that with our main character, Antoinette, and her own mother in the novel. So growing up, Jean Reese experienced isolation at home and, and also later on in her life, but she turned to books for companionship. During that time as a child, she really found a connection with the black servants of the house as they offered her a different perspective of life and language. Um, in 1907, she was sent to Perth School for Girls in Cambridge, England. So she left, you know, Dominica and traveled across the country, across oceans to a new, new country. And it was really different in terms of climate, landscape, culture, and and she was alienated and isolated by her classmates because of her Creole background, because of where she came from and, and her level of intelligence. In 1909, so she was still relatively young, about 19 years old, her father dies and she becomes financially reliant on other men. And her relationship with men were really toxic and they were complicated. She had three marriages and two affairs. And her whole life, she struggled with alcoholism and depression. And so she was really well aware that her own writing, um, and you see that in White Across the Sea, was really influenced by her own isolation, by poverty, and really other life experiences. So the novel itself was published in 1966. She wrote it a long time ago in 1939, and she spent over 10 years, you know, just getting it out there. Um, and it's neocolonialism and post-colonialism literature. Um, essentially, neocolonialism is how economic and political and cultural pressures attempted to control or pressure countries, such as the British colonies. And post-colonialism was really the studies of the issues of colonialism, the issues of British colonization, and other colonization in general, and also decolonialism, the abolition of slavery, the issues of, of transitioning there. Um, just some thematic ideas that you want to be mindful of as you're reading and maybe annotating. Um, colonial life versus island sensuality, gender relations, identity, patriarchal oppression, racial isolation, money, and then Catholic versus Protestant. You see a couple of these in Jane Eyre, um, but some of them are new, right? Colonial life versus island sensuality, gender relations dependency, uh, racial isolation, those are a little more seen strongly in this novel than they were in Jane Eyre. So like I told you, this is like a prequel tangent spinoff to Jane Eyre. Reese did a couple different things with the novel. Um, Jane Eyre was narrated in 1818, 1819 about events that took place in 1798. So like Jane Eyre growing up like as a child was like 1798 to the 18, early 1800s. But Reese actually sets this novel way later in 1830s, 1840s. She also never mentions Mr. Rochester's name. He's actually mentioned as the husband or the man, but you know who he is, like you know. She really essentially wrote this novel because she felt that the Creole in Shella Bronte's novel was a lay figure, repulsive, which does not matter, and not once alive, which does for me. She must be right on stage. She must be at least plausible with the past. The reason why he treats her so abominably and feels justified, the reason why he thinks she is mad, and why of course she goes mad, and even the reason why she tries to set everything on fire and eventually succeeds. She gives birth a, a life, a story. And so, again, it's set in the 1840s, just after the passing of the Emancipation Proclamation, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides. And it's divided into three parts. It's like childhood, marriage, and death, but also three different settings. In Jamaica, to Dominica, to England itself. And the entirety of the book is written first person point of view, mostly from Antoinette, but in parts two and three, you also find it juxtaposed with Rochester's point of view and also later on, Grace Poole's point of view.
So here's a little map, a little bit of geography here. I don't have the map of, I mean, you'll want a bigger map to find out where England is, but we start off again in Jamaica, and then we move later on in part two to Dominica. So, and then of course, off the map, if you wanna look at a real map, you have England. And so a little bit about the colonies, Jamaica was um, an English colony and it was captured from the Spanish in 1655 and became a British colony in 1670. Martinique is a French colony and that's important to note because the English and the French at the time didn't really have the best of relations. And so people from the Martinique were quote unquote not trusted, disliked, kind of discriminated against, prejudiced, all that stuff. Dominica was passed back and forth between France and England for the entirety of the second half of the 18th century, but at the time it was sold by France back to England. So again, you have that angst between French and English. Um, and then you also have some like language and culture that's like kind of blended there in Dominica. Massacre Dominica is important. It's a really kind of, you know, dark name for a village and that's purposeful because that's also where Rochester and um, Antoinette spend their marriage you know and that's purposeful and symbolic and it was a fishing village that was named after the murder of about 60 to 70 Carib men women and children so I talked about it very briefly and talking about more now. So England has its own dark roots with slavery. And essentially, it finally ended its slave trade in 1807. But slavery itself was not abolished until 1833. So even though trading of slaves was over, slaves still were owned and you know, taken advantage of up until 1833, but even then the act took effect a year later. And so afterwards, between 1834 and 1838, the former slaves in the colonies were forced to work under a so-called apprenticeship system, which sounds really nice, but really which is another form of slavery. Um, essentially, former masters were required to uh, provide apprentice laborers with food, clothing, housing, medical care, and to give land on which apprentices could like create and grow their own produce. Um, but like it really was just slavery again because these laborers couldn't choose their employers. They couldn't negotiate wages. So they really had no wages and it was just worse. It wasn't any better. Additionally, on top of that, sugar planters, because of decline of sugar production, began a campaign of disparaging black labor and calling for importation of indentured laborers, actually Asian laborers. And this led to the characterization of black workers as lazy, quote unquote. Quote. Although that's not the case at all. Like ex-slaves were extremely productive according to history. They became small proprietors and landholders, but you have this perpetuation of, oh, they're lazy and they're terrible, which is a problem. Lots, it's really problematic, obviously. Um, in terms of just, you know, the population at the time, only 4% were identified as white in 1844. And when Jean Reese grew up, um, only 1% was white. And so you had this, the fact that, you know, you were the colonizer, but you were also the minority on top of that. And so Antoinette was in this weird spot because she was, her family was former slave owners. So everyone probably hated her. And also she was white. Um, and so they had, there's that whole, it was, it's, a, it's a whole messy thing that we'll talk about as we read and progress. Um, it's important terms for context. You have Maroons, um, and they're referred to runaway slaves and their descendants who escaped and lived free. You have Colored, which we know it in terms of colored person is someone of a different race or ethnicity. At the time, Colored is of mixed, specifically white and black racial ancestry. Then you have Creole, and I know you've heard the term Creole probably in terms of like Creole, Cajun, Louisiana, but at the time of the novel, this term was used in the British Caribbean islands to refer to those of English or European descent born in the Caribbeans. So if you were English or European originally, quote unquote, and you were born in the Caribbeans, you were Creole. But there are a lot of contradictory meanings. It, it changed a lot. Like again, originally it was people who were English who were born in the colonies, and so that was to indicate so-called racial purity. But later on, it was referred to slaves and animals locally born. And so then later on, the, you had white Creoles and black Creoles. Um, and as of the 19th century, it was increasingly used to indicate racial mixture. If you think about in Louisiana, Creole Cajun food, it's a mixture of food. It has a mixture of French and Caribbean and Southern. Um, it was believed you know, as the time progressed, 
um, in mainland England that Creoles, Creole people were having been tropicalized because they lived out in the you know, Caribbean. They were emotionally high strung. They were lazy. They were sexually excessive. It was like a negative thing to be tropicalized, to be quote unquote savage and wild. Again, a lot of problems we see there, but that was just how they viewed it at the time. And, and so we'll talk about that later. Patois is a French word in English referred to any dialect that develops out of contact between the language of colonizing people, such as British, French, Dutch, and that of a colonized people, such as West Africans or Native Americans. So essentially, the dialect, a blend of a colonized and colonizers, and it was used derogatorily. It was not a positive thing, this word patois. Sleeping in the moonlight is a phrase, and it refers to the belief that Looking at the full moon for a long period of time or sleeping on the full moon will cause madness. If you think of the term lunacy, the root word luna, lunar, lunacy was described as a kind of insanity that was interrupted by lucid intervals that was supposedly influenced by changes in the moon. A Nancy or a Nancy, can't pronounce it, derived from West African and Caribbean tales, a cunning and greedy spider who cannot take on different forms and who succeeds not by strength but by trickery. Spiders being tricky and clever is definitely a thing. This is an important term that would have, probably would have helped with Jane Eyre a little bit better, but primogeniture. Um, it is the idea of patrilineal, so male, masculine, men, inheritance that granted all land to the eldest son. And they thought this is essential to continue English culture. And so nevertheless, followers so typically exercise their right to settle some portion of the estate to younger sons and daughters, although younger sons often married heiresses to support themselves. If you remember, Rochester is a younger son. He's a second son, and he receives £30,000 through an arranged marriage with Bertha, who is Antoinette in our novel. So a couple of things about African spiritual connections, because there's mentions of these religious leanings. And so Africans brought much of their own beliefs to the colonies, and that included religious leanings. Voodoo, and it's spelled the original version here, Voodoo, but it's Voodoo. It is a creolized syncretic religion. It combines several West African religions. It was transported, ported with the slaves and, and adapted to the new social and political situation of slavery, and also over with Christian symbols. So you had some kind of um, mixture there, and it often used poisons and offerings. Obia is essentially like a practitioner, a person, um, but it's also a system of beliefs and practices. And essentially, this practitioner works to gain her or his client success, money, love, cures for illnesses, protection, and cause trouble for clients' enemies. So they were essentially healers and spiritual leaders. And there's a little bit more information, but you can kind of just you know look at that later, read that later. Sucreants are legendary blood-sucking creatures, typically female, who travels by night as a ball of fire but looks like an ordinary person by day. So essentially like your version of a vampire. And zombie, and yes, you are probably familiar with the word zombie, but a zombie is a person whose soul has been stolen or put to sleep by a sorcerer who takes full command of that body for his or her purposes. And if you think about that, it's like this metaphor for really the experience of plantation slaves, like a person whose soul has been stolen by a slave owner who takes command of his or her body for their own purposes. Um, but zombies were often considered created by poisoning, by tetrodotoxin and essentially it causes a catatonic state resembling death and they're given an antidote and kept in isolation and the victim becomes a zombie essentially. Um, and another symbolic part of the zombie really was to give them a new name and this is super important but in African societies changing a name is powerful enough to change a person entirely. That is so changing a name is important. It changes them completely. Be mindful of that. So important. So there are the three main characters that you want to be mindful of are, of course, the Antoinette, who is Bertha, Edward Rochester, and Christophine. There are a couple of other minor characters, but I'll talk about that later, and you'll find them as we progress, but just wanted to kind of give you access to this to kind of see the overview. Some symbols and motifs that you want to be mindful of. A lot of it actually is similar to Jane Eyre. Fire, color, dreams, insanity. Um, other new ones um, you want to maybe name, make note of is parrot, mirrors, and obey a magic. <laughs> 
Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Hopefully this is 15 minutes. If not, I have to cut this video in half. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to stop this here now.